I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I've explained why in, in last week's talk, warm-heartedness can lower our, lower our internal stress levels, including by neural activity that inhibits activation of the alarm bell of the brain, our friendly amygdala. What I'd like to do now is to introduce two additional factors that help support a stability of presence. I'd like to note, of course, that uh, other people and other traditions uh, have different notions. Their, their list of five might be different. Uh, it might overlap my list of five in some ways. Uh, sometimes people are using different words to say the same thing, but other times, sometimes they're using the same words to mean very different things. And so some kind of clarity about that is helpful. So I encourage you, as the Buddha famously said, see for yourself what has the ring of truth for you over time in what I'm offering here and what is personally helpful, okay? So in addition to the factor of intention and the factor of calm and related to calm, contentment, and third, the factor of warm-heartedness, lovingness, compassion, good wishes, goodwill. In addition to those three, now I'd like to talk about two more. So number four would be a sense of things as a whole. And I'll explain what I mean by that and why the sense of things as a whole has been for me one of the most useful psycho-spiritual neurological hacks that I've come across uh, in the last five or 10 years. It's that useful. And then the fifth and last is an intimation of timelessness in whatever way that is meaningful for you. That fifth factor is the hardest to talk about. And as we move increasingly into ultimate matters in our own practice, it becomes increasingly uh, where the action is. As I've mentioned previously, uh, I'm very inspired by the example of the Buddha who offered teachings that were, as he put it, good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. He had no secret teachings. He offered everything to people, not restricted by any kind of a priest class, let's say, or hierarchical levels you had to go through to get the real stuff. It's right there, uh, certainly in the... Um, the record, the surviving written records in Chinese, Sanskrit, and in particular, Pali, P-A-L-I, of his teachings. So in much the same way, I'm not the Buddha, and though appreciating his, his approach, uh, I'm interested in a range of tools and ideas and practices that are useful for you wherever you are. And there are people who are really kind of just beginning in their engagement with their own mind and how to practice with it and trying to find some footing there. There are, are also people in this gathering who have been meditating and practicing and exploring psycho-spiritual tools for 30, 40, 50 or more years and who, um, like me, have a real interest in the upper, upper, uppermost reaches of human potential. Uh, have a real interest in what the Buddha called the heartwood of spiritual practice, that unshakable liberation of the mind, uh, by which he means the totality of consciousness, not just intellect. So in that light, I definitely will be exploring with you the fifth factor, an intimation of timelessness, and I'll tell you more what I mean by that. Okay, so let's take a look at the fourth factor here, which I'm calling uh, things as a whole. A quick review of some brain science that you might already be familiar with, including perhaps from me. I'll be quick about it. So what's going on when we're not stably present? Let's start there. What's going on? 
what's going on when your attention is darting from this to that, or you're kind of carried away or hijacked by something or other? What's going on in your brain? Well, what's going on is a lot of activity in the midline of the cortex, the upper middle areas. In the front portions, the frontal regions of that midline are parts of the brain that are very involved with task-oriented doing. Uh, in the rearward portions of that midline cortex, and I'm summarizing a lot of stuff here, uh, are, is the so-called default mode network, uh, where we kind of go when we're spacing out, daydreaming, mind wandering, or ruminating. In Whether it's in the front or the rear, there tends to be a lot of mental time travel, going into the future, considering the past, and a lot of uh, reference to self, me, myself, and I, my precious. And if you think about what it is to not be collected and gathered together with a stability of presence, huh? there's a lot about that that involves midline cortical activation. There's a place for that. There's, actually, there's a, certainly a place for the executive functions and planning and problem solving more related to you know, frontal activation. And there's research that shows that we need to clock some time daydreaming. <laughs> You know, we need to let the mind wander some of the time, partly to kind of sort stuff out and clear out the crud. And also sometimes new creative associations come, you know, come to mind. On the other hand, a lot of that mind wandering involves what I call the ruminator, <laughs> the simulator, the ruminator caught up in little mini movies looping over and over again with associated negative affect, which has a gradually increasingly toxic impact on our own psychology, and often relationships with others. So how do we get out of the ruminator? And how do we disengage when we're done with task-oriented doing? You know, with that kind of ongoing murmuring in the back of the mind about the next thing to do, or the undone things that will need your attention tomorrow. How to do that? Amazing research initiated um, by Norm Farb, Norman Farb, uh, and colleagues, and you can look up the references for this, found that uh, a very effective way to reduce activity in the midline is to go uh, get, is to activate networks on the sides of the brain that uh, reciprocally inhibit those midline cortical networks. And we can activate these networks on the sides of the brain, particularly right-sided for right-handed people, by getting a sense of things as a whole, including the sense of the whole of our own consciousness in, this, in the present. Dr. Farb found that then activity in the midline reduces, activity in these lateral mainly right-sided for right-handed people, networks, increases. And people report a sense of coming out of mental time travel, so now they're in the present. They report a sense of being with things as they are, rather than caught up in their evaluations and descriptions of them. They report reduced verbal activity, because as activity in the right hemisphere of right-hand people increases, activity in the left hemisphere decreases where our verbal centers are for both producing and understanding uh, language. And there's less sense of self, less sense of taking things personally, less preoccupations, less possessiveness, less identification, less positionality, less attachment to me, and thus greater stability of presence. So how can we get out of the ruminator? How can we activate these lateral networks? As I said, the sense of things as a whole is a major portal into that kind of activation 
because the right hemisphere of the brain is involved with gestalt awareness, a sense of things as a whole. Additionally, as I talk about in my book, Neurodharma, especially the sixth practice of opening into allness, as James Austin, wonderful neurologist, has written about and others have explored, uh, the brain tends to toggle back and forth between uh, perceptual processing that is self-referential about me, think of it as egocentric, and perceptual processing that is more objective. It's about things as they are without privileging your personal perspective. We need both of those. The brain kind of switches back and forth routinely between them. And if we're interested in getting a sense of things as a whole, one of the most effective ways to do that is to lift your gaze to the horizon. And as you do that, huh, you start having less of a sense of taking things personally. And so when we do this, when we get a sense of something as a whole, including the visual field as a whole, with our gaze raised, you'll just notice immediately your mind is getting quieter, less verbal, less self-referential, it becomes much more rested in the present. A certain stressfulness or cares and concern, concerns move to the sidelines, also helping you be more stably present, not so preoccupied with cares and concerns or chasing after them or trying to do something about them. You're here. You're now. And I invite you to, to try it. For example, you might just bring awareness to the sense of breathing in your chest as a whole. What does that do to your mood? You know, within a few breaths. If you're frazzled with somebody and you know, starting to argue about something with them or you're a little irritated with them, what happens to your mind when you go up to the bird's eye view? Big picture, more objectively, you see them, you see them, you see yourself, you see other relevant factors, other people maybe, circumstances, events, when you go up to that 10,000 foot view, you're more stably present. You're less swept away. We might think of midline activation as very broadly associated with forms of doing. And we might think of lateral network activation, and more broadly, the sense of things as a whole, much more associated with various aspects of being. As we rush about in doing mode, it's really hard to be stably present. If you're super duper on top of your game, longtime Zen practitioner at the Zen Bakery of San Francisco Zen Center. Totally centered and present. Fantastic. But for, for lesser mortals, running around doing <clears throat> does not help us be stably present. On the other hand, shifting into being. Ah, plop. We land here which brings us into now. Some simple ways for you to, you know, work the muscle of being and a sense of things as a whole, which is really important because our modern culture and typical schooling and everyday life tends to be a real reinforcing of midline cortical activation. 
both task-oriented in the front and wandering mind and ruminating in the back. So as you meditate, uh, you might really like to explore the sense of the breath, uh, the sensations of breathing in your body as a whole, rather than just located at one spot, like the upper lip or the belly or diaphragm. That's a good training in uh, being able to abide with things as a whole, body as a whole. Another training supported, frankly, by abiding as a body as a whole is to get a sense of open awareness and, ab and being aware, abiding as awareness of mind as a whole. That might sound abstract. We tend to chase one part of the stream of consciousness after another, and that creates a lot of suffering. You can just watch your mind. But when you go out to, oh, mind as a whole, being consciousness as a whole, including awareness and its objects as a single unified whole, which is always actually the case. We just continually, dualistically fragment and separate um, and divide ourselves internally from that whole. So you can come into a sense of mind as a whole. Um, see what that's like. You'll notice that as soon as you come into a sense of mind or consciousness, I use the words interchangeably here, as a whole, instantly you come to peace. That whole may include agitation, anxiety, physical pain, moral outrage, deep concern about others. It can include all of that. But when you move out to the whole, you're not suffering anymore. Wow. That's an exploration. Third, you can get a sense of your physical environment as a whole. The room as a whole. That's a nice little practice to do just before you drop into meditation. Get a sense of the place you're in. It's good. It's also useful in terms of trauma-informed mindfulness to scan, to look around like the animal we are, to make sure there are no predators in the room with you. It's okay. Sense of the room as a whole. Fantastic. It's also really helpful to get a sense of the big picture of the situations you're in, including your life, your life as a local expression, a reality as a whole. That's really helpful too. Big picture about situations, big picture about struggles you have with some people maybe, big picture about maybe aspirations you have uh, that are, are not that are not going well, or might start, you know, or maybe they're quite successful. They're going, but you need more perspective on them. And I might add, quoting Thich Nhat Han here in the chat. In the largest sense, we can start getting a sense of wow, we're a local expression of everything. And as you do that, as you move through these various ways I'm describing here, of abiding as a whole, your mind gets steadier and quieter, including because of the neurology of all this. I love this quotation from Thich Nhat Hanh, bless his memory, and uh, it's one that I've shared before. I'll read it right now. Beloved one, you are not something that has been created. You did not come into the realm of being from the realm of non-being. You are a wonderful manifestation, like a pink cloud on the top of a mountain or a mysterious moonlit night. You are a flowing stream, the continuation of so many wonders. You are not a separate self. You are yourself, but you are also me. You cannot take the pink cloud out of my fragrant tea this morning, and I cannot drink my tea without drinking my cloud. I am in you and you are in me. 
If we take me out of you, then you would not be able to manifest as you are manifesting now. If we take you out of me, I would not be able to manifest as I am manifesting now. We cannot manifest without one another. We have to wait for each other in order to manifest together. Now, this is certainly a very profound aspect of abiding as a whole. And consistent with what I said previously about it, about teachings that are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, Thich Nhat Hanh is speaking from his own profound realization. And yet he's speaking the truth that is true for all of us from his profound realization. You know, he's, he's the messenger of a truth. He, he's identifying a truth that is true for all of us as well. And in, in the very beginning, you might have, or I'm, one might have a, just a sense of this. And yet over time, it can become increasingly, uh, there can be a felt knowing increasingly of what is true. And then um, I'd like to talk about the fifth factor, the most uh, ineffable and yet fundamental of all. So the Buddha did not hold back. And he, like many others throughout history and in the present, have pointed to um, that which could, is meaningfully distinct from the conditioned, ordinary, natural, still remarkable, and yet ordinary, natural, conditioned unfolding of the Big Bang universe. He's talking about reality, the entire world, including our own mental processes, as in flames. And a lot of that was metaphor, because fire was a, a strong metaphor in his time. In other words, it's, it's busy, it's happening, it's occurring, it's, it's impermanent. The entire world is in flames, the entire world is going up in smoke. The entire world is burning, the entire world is vibrating. But that which does not vibrate or burn, which is experienced by the noble ones, where death has no entry, there's no impermanence, in that my mind delights. What in the world is he talking about? Now, before I go any further, I really want to include uh, what Sarah wrote. Uh, I'll use your name if you use it so people can see it uh, at nine minutes past the hour. Sarah wrote, thank you. My first time here. Too many concepts to grab at one time. I guess it will be slowly one thing at a time, but how do I establish a priority on the information you are providing? Incredibly fundamental and great question for anyone at any point along the path. How do we identify what matters most to us right now? The topic here for us all is how do we get more control over our busy, busy, fragmented, darting about minds? How do we, how do we slow it down? How do we steady it so we can see what's going on and we can feel more stable, more present, calmer, more rested? That's what we're exploring here. And <clears throat> that starts with intention. So the intention that brought Sarah and brought other people here, good intention. And are you on your own side? Are you a friend to yourself to want to help yourself feel more grounded, more centered? more at home in yourself amidst the stresses and multitasking and jostling of every day. Yes. So know what that intention feels like. That will really help to steady you. It also helps to do things that develop greater calm and contentment in the present as it is. Okay, And it helps to have a warm heart. These are very straightforward. They're in plain English, as I'm speaking them, in, intending to kind of stabilize yourself and find your footing. 
valuing that, making that important to you. Also, encouraging yourself to uh, do things that help you calm down and appreciate, you know, the enoughness already that's often here with gratitude and thankfulness. That helps us calm down and opening the heart and connecting from the heart with others, receiving their caring, expressing your caring. That helps us calm down. And it's important to appreciate um, that the real test of all that is whether it works for you. So it's not, it's, we start with concepts, but we start moving increasingly into, oh, what touches my heart? What feels right? What do I want to increasingly internalize? And often there'll be one thing, you know, I, I remember maybe five things from four years in college, you know, I don't know. What's the one thing that is really, you know, speaks to you here that you want to take with you? All right. So that's, that's fundamental. That's absolutely fundamental. And now I want to talk about the fuzziest of all. So here we go. Uh, the Buddha basically said that um, number five, uh, an intimation or intuition of timelessness, that what he called that which is unconditioned, in effect, always just before conditioned unfolding, um, was the ultimate refuge, was the ultimate refuge. And I would just like to not get lost in talking about this. In my book, Neurodharma, I spend a chapter on timelessness, what that could mean, how to relate to it, and so forth. Uh, if you don't relate to this one, it's okay. But I invite you, because we want to talk about what's good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. I invite you to consider, do you have an intuition yourself of a kind of, you might think of it as a level inside you, or a core inside you that seems completely distinct from the impermanent, transient, hurly-burly of the unfolding of the mind. It, you might have a sense of it as a stable field of awareness, of witnessing. It might feel like an underlying ground of being that's real for you. You're not in touch with it probably you know, all the time, but you'd go, yeah, I have a sense of what you're talking about. could be experienced as just a place of unconditional peacefulness deep inside, no matter what storms are raging overhead. And as you know, as soon as you get in touch with that layer or level or core inside yourself, whoosh, you're steadily present. You're here. You're stably present now. And ultimately, since I believe this um, level at a minimum is an attribute of our own biology, and as long as we live, it is reliable. It is not dependent on our circumstances or, and it's, it's deeper than, it's distinct from any experience we're having at the time. So no experience can taint it or uh, overpower it. So it becomes a very, very reliable refuge for you and a growing sense of whatever is true for you about this core or level in you, whew, is really, really good. And if you have any sense of what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. And then maybe, uh, mysteriously related to that core or level in our own body, our own biology, um, 
I believe the Buddha pointed to a, a transcendental, ultimate ground of being that is unconditioned and therefore timeless and eternal. And others, including in the Buddhist tradition, have pointed to qualities of that ultimate ground of being of awareness and even a kind of love. If that's not real for you, forget about it. If it is real for you, what happens when you get in touch with that? It might be religious for you, the divine. It might not be. It might be simply a sense of timelessness, a kind of field in which the time-bound Big Bang universe keeps unfolding. But what happens when you get in touch with it? You're here, you're now, you're stably present. So this too, contact with this, access to this, is a major factor of steadiness of mind, stability of presence. Okay, focus on whatever's useful for you. Five different ways, wow, to find that, that inner peace, that steadiness, that groundedness, that freedom, in effect, from being swept away by the demands of others or the bubbling whateverness of our own mind. Five different ways. You don't have to do them all. Any one of them will really help. Intention, calm and contentment, warm-heartedness, a sense of things as a whole, and an unconditional no, level or layer or ground that in, in which that's distinct somehow from the passing show. Okay, uh, Sarah Thomas asked, any research on left-handed people? Most studies, you know, they want to reduce the variables, um, so they'll typically just focus on right-handed people often. I'm not aware of, I know there's been research on left-handed people, and there's some interesting stuff about maybe they, for whatever reasons, have more integration of left and right hemispheres uh, than right-handed people do, typically, uh, even if for some left-handed people, their verbal centers are on the right hemisphere and visual spatial gestalt processing is on the left. And you might look into this, uh, look into this further. Okay. And so if the, the larger points I'm making about uh, the difference, what's called hemispheric specialization, are true whether you're left-handed or right-handed. Uh, it may be that if you're left-handed, your visual spatial is still on the right side and your verbal centers are still on the left. It could be swapped over, but the general principle is still true that there's a key distinction between midline cortical activation and lateral on the sides of the brain, network activation. And it kind of doesn't matter which hemisphere those lateral networks are um, activated in as long as, it, as it's, in, it's the hemisphere that handles visual, spatial, nonverbal gestalt processing, the sense of things as a whole. Breathing as a whole, okay, here we are. So uh, you can observe that when you focus on breathing, meditation of the breath, uh, you know, very often attention kind of bounces from one location in the body to another, one, one area of sensation after another, all right? You can also burp alternately, put your attention on one place, like around the upper lip and nose, and just stay there for 40 minutes. I've done that kind of meditating. It can really concentrate you. Okay. Third, you can see what it's like to expand awareness, starting with a fairly small area if this is at all challenging for you, such as um, you know, an immediate area in the center of your chest, and be aware of multiple sensations there, and yet kind of expand the spotlight of awareness so it takes in the whole field there, the center of the chest. What's that like? 
and then expand out. What's it like to be aware of the sensations of breathing on the left side of your chest and the right side of your chest and left and right together? What's it like to be aware of sensations in the front or in the back and then front and back together, right? And as you explore this, your sense of the whole may initially crumble as it did for me, but then with practice and training of those right-sided circuits for right-handed people, you more and more are able to just drop in to a, a sense of your chest and then your torso all together and then your body all together as a single field of many sensations. That's what I'm talking about. So you can do that. Uh, in terms of lifting your gaze, um, if you, and you can just notice, it's really interesting. If you just bring your gaze to within like a few feet of your body, you'll notice your mind or start, will start to move into kind of a self-referential uh, you know, stream of thoughts and feelings and ideas and issues. It's kind of about me, right? Not bad. It, it's not conceited or arrogant. It's just really about me. <laughs> but if you then deliberately, including if you're troubled by something, in which naturally leads us to self-preoccupations, if you deliberately lift your gaze to the roughly the horizon line or above it, see what happens within a few dozen seconds half a minute. The sense of self tends to get quieter and there's more of a sense of things as a whole. You could explore this. It's not like some super duper powerful switch that goes brink, brink. You know, it's more of a question of degree, but you can notice, ah, oh, there's a change there. And it's interesting that uh, in the Zen tradition, uh, in terms of times when people um, have a uh, classic self-transcendent non-dual experience in which the sense of self falls away and the sense of the world, the universe, whoosh, uh, shines forth in radiant perfection, various descriptions of this, most of the episodes, uh, James Austin has pointed out, of that in the Zen tradition that are reported uh, do not occur during formal practice. They often involve being outside, where there's more of a sense of the whole, often with the gaze lifted, and often with a sense of surprise. Plop, the frog fell into the pond, or classically, the bottom fell out of a bamboo a basket uh, in an Enlightenment poem from a, from a Zen nun whose name escapes me in the moment, sorry. Anyway, uh, surprise. And surprise, by the way, whoop, pulls us out of midline activation whoop, and takes us out into a sense of things as a whole, in part because when our ancestors back in Jurassic Park were surprised by a sound here or there, they needed to, you know, uh, move out of kind of a whatever self-referential thing they were doing at the time, eating this or looking at that, whoop, to get a sense of things as a whole surprise. So to the extent that we're hanging out at the front edge of now, with beginner's mind, we get continually surprised, which helps us remain steadily present. Okay. So, and again, I'm just naming a bunch of tools. Uh, if you relate to some, great. If you don't, that's okay. And it's out of respect for you that I'm going through all five of these ways to steady the mind, including the last two, which take us into some pretty deep places. I'm going to finish with a question from 1969, the year I started at UCLA. They write, I think the hardest thing for me is how to discern where all of these principles make me passive due to increased tolerance and patience versus when enough is enough. I am afraid that I don't forget to stand up when I need to while following these really good human being principles. I like that. That's going to be the title of a book. Really good human being principles. I like that a lot. Um, could you comment, Rick? This is a struggle for me. Fantastic. Super important. 
Um, <clears throat> Buddhism and, and other spiritual traditions have been critiqued for being way too quiescent and not sufficiently outraged at the conditions of the world. And if people use their practice as a so-called spiritual bypass to not deal with uh, the troubles inside themselves or the troubles out around themselves, that's a problem. That's not, to, that's not good. So then the question becomes, how can I um, develop qualities of equanimity and stability and a kind of unconditional uh, resilient well-being in the core of me that doesn't depend upon circumstances and other people. How can I develop all that in ways that don't promote, you know, selfish navel gazing, blissed out in the corner? Great question, right? Classic. Um, what I've found, and I think most people find, is that it's a very fair concern, but it usually doesn't happen, you know. Yes, there are people who have really got their mantra going and they're annoying because they're just not dealing with the fact that the house is burning down or their society's house with injustice, et cetera, is burning down around them. Ah. But most people, and I bet this will happen for you as well, as they develop this increasingly unshakable core inside themselves, unconditioned, unshakable inside themselves, that's the result of training and practice over time. Um, it becomes a trait based on the internalization of many states of being in which they were calm and content and at peace. Um, as you develop that, you actually become feistier. <laughs> you become quicker to just see, no, no, not going to go there, not going to believe that, no. That's not accurate. That's actually not true. That's not what actually happened. Um, and you, you become more prepared to speak truth to power. You become clearer about your values. You become more aware of what promotes um, durable well-being in people because you've trained in that yourself. And so you become a stronger advocate for societal conditions and you know, kind of local conditions in your family and workplace and neighborhood for what actually is healthy, what actually promotes um, lasting well-being and flourishing. That, that's what I have found in general. So it, often this takes care of itself. Uh, it can be helpful to recognize where you are in kind of a rhythm. Sometimes, frankly, we give up on the world for a while because we got to do our work inside here. We just don't have the juice for social action. We're trying to explain yet again to somebody, uh, you know, what's kind of wrongheaded about what they're saying. We don't have the juice for it. We've got to focus here. But then there's a rhythm that after we do that inner work moves into outer action. And we do that for a while and then maybe we realize, wow, I'm getting kind of fried. Um, you know, the, the anger and the outrage and the fury is really kind of penetrating the thatched roof of my own mind. And oof, you know, I need to, I need to come home to me for a while. Uh, I'm on that rhythm myself, actually, having really put out a lot of energy for the Global Compassion Coalition and some, other, and some other externally directed things. You know, my rhythm is now moving back home again. So being aware of where we are in that process and paying attention and making sure we don't, you know, get too stuck in inner practice or too stuck in outer action. I think that's really helpful. Being in community with others, incredibly helpful because uh, they help to guide us, to give us feedback, really. Um, and then last, I'll finish on this, having a sense of, okay, if you have Going back to Sarah's, I love Sarah's question. <laughs> it's so good. It's right on. What really matters? What should I pay attention to in all this? Pick one thing inside yourself and one thing outside yourself. That's your priority. And then work on it. So you make sure you're, you're doing both, whatever those are. Know what they are. What are you helping to heal and, and to grow inside yourself? You can have more than one thing, but what's clearly one thing? And 
you know, what are your efforts aimed at outside yourself? You know, that really matter to you. Um, for me, uh, I think that, uh, you know, for me outside me, I certainly have deep values around um, the welfare of children. And related to that, deep concern about the causes of global warming and the immediate need to uh, reduce emissions and, and um, capture carbon, et cetera. But even deeper than that, and I'm just being myself, I'm not trying to persuade you this. Deeper than that, um, I look at the root causes of healthiness uh, in human societies as um, factors of civil society and reductions of inequalities of wealth and power. And I look at uh, the deep roots of so much, so many systemic worldly causes of human suffering over the last 10,000 years that really boil down to inequalities of wealth and power and disruption of the civil society on the local scale that occurred inside our hunter-gatherer bands uh, for 300,000 years as humans and for a couple million years before that. You know, fundamental characteristics inside our band that are the foundation of civil society of you know, common truth, common welfare, and common justice. So I myself am particularly interested in doing things that promote common truth, common welfare, and common justice, and as an aspect of common justice that regulate and reduce um, massive concentrations of wealth and power. That's it for me. What is it for you when you focus outside yourself? It could be very straightforward, like getting a stop sign next to your kid's school, or you know, getting your neighbor to clip their tree so it doesn't keep dropping rotten fruit and leaves into your backyard, whatever that might be. What is that outside yourself? So when you know what it is inside you and outside you that are top of the list for you these days, um, that can really guide you in this balance.